we are recording this session. So if you miss anything or you want to go back and review, it will be available later today on our website. Um, I would like to kick things off right now and introduce the president of the STAR Group, Mr. Paul M. Newberger. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Good morning, everybody. What a blessing it is to have you join us here for this Back to Work webinar. Very excited to have you, and boy, howdy, I'd, I'd say, to, to say that we've been in uncharted territory over the course of the past couple of months would be the biggest understatement in the history of understatements, and if you're anything like us, from time to time, your head was spinning, you had a headache, you had to take a nap, and also maybe had some of these moments of, of panic. Where do we go? What do we do? This is... This is unprecedented. This is a disruption unlike any other disruption we've ever had professionally. And as a management team here at the Star Group, we certainly weren't immune to moments of anxiety, stress, and then occasionally despair. But how we were able to pull, how we were able to pull this together, how we were able to come together as a team really meant a lot to us in terms of uh, getting the agency back up and running. So what we wanted to do here today is we just wanted to walk you through this webinar, this case study for strategically and safely bringing employees back to work. Just two things I want to say before we get to work here. Number one, we are certainly not perfect at the Star Group. Well, Mary Star is perfect. The rest of us bleed red blood. We are not perfect human beings. And we learned a lot during this process. And what we wanted to do is not talk to you in hypotheticals, not talk to you in generalities, but give you a step-by-step -step case study for how we were able to successfully, safely reopen the STAR group. And Cheryl, if you don't mind turning it to the next slide, please. We are gonna walk you through this in a very comprehensive manner. There were a lot of decisions that had to be made. There were a lot of conversations that took place. There was a lot of details that had to be worked out, and we're hoping that this webinar for you is basically a one-stop shop as you look at reopening your area of business and bringing your employees back safely. So these are the areas that we're going to cover over the course of the next 27 minutes, and I'm very fortunate to be joined by my co-workers and partners in crime, Maureen Arndt, and the aforementioned Mary Starr. So uh, with that, let's start diving into this complex, multifaceted approach and start letting you know what exactly we did at the Star Group uh, with respect to reopening. So Cheryl, if you don't mind turning to the next slide, please. The first decision that we had to make was really, how do we get started? And that's a tough question to answer, how do you get started? What is that first step? Now we at the Star Group, we've got a management team of five and we are not carbon copies of each other. We are different people with different thoughts, with different emotions and with different takes on things. And some of us were really gung-ho. Let's open it up tomorrow and bring everybody on board. Others maybe were a little bit more conservative. I'd rather stay at home for a little bit longer. So for us, the question became, how do we make the best decision on behalf of the agency, knowing that we all have our own subjective thoughts and emotions around this very difficult topic? So it came out in one of our conversations that maybe the best thing we should do is ascertain what we call the fear index of our nearly 40 employees. And, you know, Fear can be a great limiting factor to your success. It can be a barrier. It can be a wall. And some people will tell you fear is a false emotion. You should just move ahead and plow through. But fear is real, folks. And when you're responsible for lives in your organization, you have to take that into consideration. Our question became, well, how are we going to ascertain that fear? How are we going to figure out where our employees are in the spectrum, what they're worried about, what's important to them? So what we decided to do was to send out a survey to our employees, because really that's the initial first step. Without knowing where your employees are on the spectrum, we can't make informed decisions. If they're very scared and the last thing they want to do is leave their house, we would look tone deaf if we told everybody to come back tomorrow. However, if everybody was, for whatever reason, thinking COVID was blown out of proportion, I'm not scared about it, come on, let's get back to work, we might actually be hurting our business 
if we took too long to reopen. So we thought the survey was the, the best route to go. And it's not just that you do a survey, it's how you do the survey. So we kept this relatively brief. We didn't want to discourage our employees from not taking it by having a war and peace novel in front of them. We came up with five very simple questions. And I just want to give you some insight on these before we move on to the next topic. Number one, you have to stay away from simply yes and no questions. Yes and no is black and white. Yes and no is either or. What we have to do is we don't have to just, ex we don't just have to answer the question, does fear exist? We have to measure the level of fear. Are we talking about a tiny amount? Are we talking about none at all? Are we talking about a whole ton of it? So we came up with five questions. Now I'm going to recap this at the end. You're going to be getting white papers from us in terms of things that you can model for your organizations. But I just want to read these questions real quick and then we're going to move on to the, to the next one. How you frame the question is important. All the answers were one to five. One being strongly disagree, five being strongly agree. And the first question we asked was, I have concerns about physically returning to the office. Strongly disagree all the way to strongly agree. Two, I'm confident that management will take all the proper precautions to guarantee my health and safety. That was one of our favorite questions because we found out there was a decent amount of fear, but it was nearly unanimous that they trusted our decision. That was good for us to gauge that. Three, I am comfortable with producers holding in-person meetings versus clients' prospects returning or coming to our office. That's another thing. Do they want visitors to come to the office or should we just hunker down once we come back? Four, I feel the worst of the pandemic is behind us. That was a good question for us to know as well, because if people felt the worst was yet to come, we had to take that into consideration. And then lastly, I believe that in order to run our agency effectively, we should return to normalcy as soon as possible. So not yes or no questions. We had one through five questions to gauge their level of potential fear, and that allowed us to do everything we did next. Next slide, Cheryl. So this next slide that Cheryl is going to be pulling up here is all about management strategy and our strategy for what our next steps are going to be. So as a management team, the first thing that I would recommend is you have to communicate with your team often. And as a management team, we were conversing with each other three times a week, every Monday morning, Wednesday morning, Friday morning. That continues, even though we're now in phase one of our reopening plan. Constant communication is key because the ground is shifting under your feet on a daily basis with respect to COVID. So constant communication was good for our success. We also brought new ideas every single time that we chatted. We challenged each other, we pushed each other, we tried to poke holes in what our initial thoughts were and we had a nice diversity of opinion. And because we had so many different opinions and so many regular conversations, it, allows the, it allowed us to look at life a little bit differently and try to take different perspectives and then after, through these regular conversations, the big question became, how do we reopen? Is this a phased-in strategy or an all-at-one-time strategy? And there's pros and cons to both. Some have a, a, a high degree of urgency tension where they have to open right away. But for us, as a result of the survey, the fear gauge was rather high. Not, not, not crazy high, but higher than we initially anticipated. So what we thought was going to be best for our organization, you're going to have to make this determination for your company is because we're working so well remotely right now, there's not this incredible urgency to reopen right away. Combined with the fact that fear is a little high among our employees, so we decided to do a phased in strategy. Phase one began this week, Monday. Phase two begins on June 15th. And then our final phase, phase three, will be the last Monday in June. But we were only able to make that educated, informed decision based on the survey that we did based on the regular ongoing dialogue amongst the five of us and based on the fact that we were continually assessing and reassessing our initial plans. And up to this point, that became the initial strategy. Now, obviously, we have additional decisions to make. And to start walking you through some of these additional decisions, I'm going to turn it over to my partner in crime and friend, the one, the only, Mary Starr. Wow. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today as we navigate these uncharted waters together. Um, 
I do want to echo Paul in the sentiment that who would have thought three months ago we would be uh, hosting a webinar on returning to work and talking about things like safer at home and social distancing. I didn't even know what those phrases meant three months ago, um, let alone the need for a global pandemic plan. So quite unbelievable. But I also believe the fact that we are on this webinar is a sign of resilience and it shows a commitment to not just navigating but flourishing during these changing times. So I did want to talk about communicating your back to work plan with your staff. At the STAR Group, communication is one of our core values. So I can't stress enough how very important communication is. And um, it's especially important during times of change. Because what I've found is left without a message, what employees can come up with on their own can be far worse than reality. Maybe they think you're going out of business, you know, all kinds of things, um, and especially during times of change. So I emphasize ongoing transparent communication is vital. But it is not just about the message, it's also about the messenger. They need to hear from the leadership team. And maybe they're hearing on a regular basis uh, from their direct manager, from HR, but they need to hear from the leadership team as well. And it's important to have a defined leader who is facilitating this entire process. Personally, I choose to see the cup as half full. And I consider this to be a great opportunity because with every challenge comes opportunity and to have this ongoing communication with your team is actually a way to strengthen the employee employer relationship and to strengthen your overall culture it's time to let employees know and feel that you are there for them and that their safety and well-being is of utmost importance we often hear and we often say the words employees are our most valuable resource, but now, now is a time to prove that. You need to be empathetic, you need to be understanding, and then you need to meet them where they're at and help them move forward. And this can be from very different points for each employee because everyone has a different level of comfort and you need to be empathetic to everyone's level of concern. We have some employees who are voicing enough already. Let's just get on. Let's get back to life the way it was three months ago. And then we have other employees who are extremely anxious. Maybe they've rarely left the house or maybe they have been touched personally by COVID-19 in ways that we can't relate to. And what I actually found from our survey is that some employees voiced that they wanted to wait to come back to the office until things went back to the way they were before the pandemic. Personally, I firmly believe that is not going to happen because I think there is going to be a new normal going forward. So I feel that we need to help them adjust to this new state of affairs. And in the process, remind them of how resilient they have actually been over these past three months. And as you communicate, don't be afraid to show your vulnerability. There is, a, there is no roadmap for what we're going through. We don't have all the answers. This is unfamiliar territory and we are learning as we go and we're learning together. So I always let the team know when we roll out uh, details of our plan that it is a transitional plan because it's an evolving topic. And although we try our hardest to stay abreast of the many changes, we know that we will have to adjust our plan as we move forward because the only constant is change and we all have to adapt to this new normal. When I communicate, I choose to communicate weekly. I'm very sensitive to over communicating at a time when there is information overload out there. And in my communication, I try to stick to what is relevant. Uh, I try to be brief. I try to bullet uh, the points that are new uh, in an attempt that people will actually read 
my messages and not tune them out. And also very important to always let people know the door is open. We welcome your questions. We welcome their feedback. Not only welcome them, but we need them. We learn from them and we transition based upon our team's feedback. So our goal is for a safe, efficient, stress-free transition back to the office. And that cannot be done without ongoing, transparent, relevant, and vulnerable communication from the leadership team. Uh, next slide, Cheryl, please. So part of that is also preparing your building. You have to realize, or I mean, for us, some of our employees haven't been here for almost three months. So they're coming, you know, there's this uneasiness of what are, are we coming back to? Um, so I do know that preparing the building is going to vary be dependent upon your industry, number of employees, your business. We uh, follow the Badger Bounce Back guidelines, but whatever your guidelines, it's important to communicate the steps you are taking to prepare your building for their, re their return. Um, first, the first time I communicated the steps that we were taking, I was very proud. I'm like, oh, you know, we're really ahead of the game and we're, this is what we're doing. I'm going to tell everybody what we're doing. And actually in, in Paul's survey, so that actually made some people more anxious because they're like, wow, look at all the steps they're having to do to prepare this building and it, and it actually increased anxiety for some. But because we started this communication early and we got their feedback, we were able to assess that and to help them through that process. Again, helping people realize this is a new norm, normal and also communicating that our goal is to err on the side of caution to safeguard their safety. So maybe some is excessive, but our goal is to be overly cautious to begin with, at least in the first phases of bringing people back. So to prepare some of the basics, uh, windows clean, carpets, changing air filters, our janitorial service came in and used, a, it's called a Century Q hospital grade disinfectant protocol that they applied to the entire interior of the building. And then we've set up um, additional cleaning on an ongoing basis. Some things had been done maybe weekly. Now it's being done every other day. Things like wiping down all doorknobs, light switches, banisters, deep cleaning of all common areas. Um, we have wipes um, on everyone's workspace and uh, all common areas, also at each entrance, sneeze guards at the reception uh, area, taking out and limiting chairs in our waiting area. Uh, panels have been added to workspaces that are closer than six feet. Um, also part of the protocol will be uh, to open all doors and turn on all light switches first thing in the morning, and then at the end of the day, closing them um, and turning the light switches off. Obviously, I'm referring to internal doors. But so that's to minimize touching um, and just so that everything's open and uh, there's limited touching. We've also rerouted deliveries. We have a back entrance and um, have set it up so that all deliveries come in this way. So it's not using the common entrance, bringing things in a back entrance, taking them into one of our smaller conference room, and then hitting them with the UV disinfectant light uh, before items are dispersed. And then also proper signage, restrooms, common areas, entrances, bulletin boards, basically promoting and reminding people of the importance of personal hygiene and these new protocols. Next slide, please, Cheryl. So steps to safeguard your workforce. Of course, your most important uh, asset, uh, your team. Everyone has been provided uh, both cloth and paper masks. In our office, they're not required to wear them at all times other than in kitchen and bathroom. And I know Marina is going to talk about that. Um, our director of first impressions will be taking the temperature of everyone as a means of entering the building. Um, she will be using a no contact infrared forehead temperature gun as a condition of entering the building. It allows for confidential immediate temperature readings and our threshold is a temperature of 100.4 
or below. We're also reminding everyone of basic risk mitigation and infection prevention measures. Hand washing, signs in the bathroom, covering your mouth with tissue, and no shaking, no hugging. Practicing social distancing, no congregating, limiting coworker visits, um, and also reminding employees, if they're bringing equipment back from their remote office, that that equipment needs to be disinfected before bringing it back into the office space. Uh, reminding them no shared personal workspaces, no sharing of equipment, no common coat closets. Luckily it's summer, uh, but if there's a jacket, it goes to their personal workspace. You may have a need to stagger work days or split uh, personnel into shifts. You may need to update technology. Pardon me, you, you may need to update technology in order to support remote work on a more regular basis. And you will have the need to be more flexible as employees struggle, continue to struggle with things like childcare or adult care that may make extended work from home necessary. And lastly, the strict sick guidelines. So in the past, I think sometimes it was a badge of honor to, to come in when you were not feeling well. Well, that is definitely something of the past. Any symptoms, respiratory, fever, cough, notify management and stay at home using PTO, or if not too sick, to work remote. Uh, so for all of this to work, it does take a collaborative effort. Our muscle memory will make increased awareness along with a willingness to adapt very important. You know, think about it. I mean, how many times over these last three months I've attempted to shake someone's hand and it's like, oh, muscle memory, that's right. You know, extend the elbow. And I'm happy to say that now I've I finally got it down. So overall, our goal is to build and maintain a resilient team. And with that, I'm going to pass it to VP of Operations, Maureen Art. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Paul. Welcome everybody this morning. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about defining our common area protocol. Common areas for us, our kitchen, cafeteria, and break room are considered the same. Through phase one, we identified that this room would be closed other than the use of microwave and refrigerator, the use of our coffee pots, and physically eating in the kitchen are off limits through phase one. A mask must be worn when entering for the duration of time in that room. We limited the number of bodies to four due to the size. And we also made clear we would have no shared food, um, such as our traditional salad days we had on Wednesday or Friday cookouts for summer during Brewer games. So although there are no Brewer games, we still have to um, be clear that there are no shared food days at this time. In the restrooms, we are requiring that our employees also wear a mask um, when entering for the duration of their time in there. Wipes are made available to wipe down touched areas, as well as available to open the door and then dispense at the exit. Conference rooms, in-house meetings can take place with up to four people in our conference room, and we are practicing social distancing through phase one and two. Wipes are made available to wipe surfaces down when complete in that room. We have a workout area, which is closed at this time until we identify otherwise. And lastly, we ask everyone to make a conscious effort not to congregate in common areas, such as the reception and cafeteria, as Mary had indicated earlier. Next slide, Cheryl. We also went into defined and sent out to everyone our safe visitor protocol. We have signs posted on our building website and throughout social media, identifying our building as closed to outside visitors and we are available to them via the phone. We communicated to our employees that while we are phasing back into the office, we will not allow outside visitors in the office through phase two at the earliest. This includes vendors and clients. We find that some are eager to start meeting, yet made it clear this rule will be reinforced. As a result, business will be conducted with outside vendors virtually and clients will continue via the phone. And I, that is all I have at this time. Uh, we are back to Mary. 
All right, to close it out, so what happens um, if somebody is COVID positive? And I'm very happy to say that at the Star Group, we've been very fortunate where that has not happened. But as we move forward, that's a very real possibility. So there, there are a lot of guidelines out there. Uh, I chose to use the Advocate Aurora guidelines uh, should this happen with any of our employees. Uh, so basically, if one of our employees or someone in their household tests positive or becomes symptomatic, they need to notify management or HR immediately. And then they need to stay at home until all criteria are met. That criteria includes 72 hours passing uh, since their fever has uh, resolved. And that is without the use of aspirin, Tylenol, any fever reducing meds. And it's not or, but and a complete resolution of any respiratory symptoms, again, and improvement of all other symptoms. And lastly, and at least 10 days past since the onset, the first onset, of the symptoms. And then while maintaining confidentiality, all employees will be informed of any potential exposure to COVID-19. We also have an employee self-certification form that they would sign uh, should this become a, a situation and that they would sign saying that they have met all criteria and are at the point of being able to return to work. So I am going to turn it back to Paul Newberger. Yeah, well, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Maureen. And one of the things that I want to echo here before we open it up to questions you, is again, th th there is there is no roadmap on how to do this. Uh, we we were we're figuring this thing out as we go, and there's no case studies necessarily. There there was no book that we could reference. And one of the things that we had decided as a management team is you see a lot of information being shared out there in terms of high level best practices, general philosophies. So we wanted you to hear from us what the leaders of the star group did as imperfect as we are to try to figure this thing out. And speaking only for me, of course, before we open this up to questions, it is really two things. I mean, just like for those of you that follow the stock market, for those of you that enjoy investments, you'll know that the stock market hates uncertainty. And that's kind of why you see the market tank heading into an election. Who's going to win? We don't know. Is the incoming president going to be good for business? We don't know. Is the incoming president going to implement laws or regulations that are going to choke business? We don't know. And uncertainty usually leads to a tanking of the stock market. And as leaders, uncertainty can lead to a tanking in your corporate culture and employee morale. So one of the things that I would just implore everybody on this call to do is just try to maintain some semblance of certainty. Give your employees some semblance of certainty. And I learned that along the way. I'm a rather young buck. I've been the president here for three years now, and I'm learning every single day. And I got great people to learn from, including Mary and Maureen. But I kind of came into this with my own preconceived notion. This is what I believe about COVID. This is what I think we should do. But boy, if, uh, if we went necessarily with what I wanted to do without first gauging the employees, there would have been a disconnect. So even though it wasn't necessarily what I would have done up front, because we listened to the employees, because we surveyed the employees, and because we put in these measures, we gave our employees certainty. Again, whether they liked it or not, doesn't really matter 100% of the time. I mean, what, what really matters is whether you agree philosophically you at least know what's coming. You at least know what lies ahead. There's at least a plan in place. And our management scores have been through the roof. People have trust in us, confidence in us. They appreciate all of this. And that's been great. And that leads me to my second and final point. Your ability to maintain confidence, uh, to maintain confidence, to maintain a high degree of confidence among your employee base is also very important. Do they trust your decisions? Do they trust the process? Do they trust that you have their best interests at heart? And if you seek their feedback, if you have regular open communication, if you're having a two-way dialogue on a regular basis throughout the process, you're more likely to have the certainty that they crave, as well as maintaining a high degree of confidence, which is something you need as a leader. So with that being said, we're going to open it up for questions. Boy, are we good ladies or what? Exactly 10 o'clock. 
it's like we've done this before. Uh, I actually did have a couple of questions emailed to me, so I'm sitting on a couple here, but what I'd like to do is open it up to the attendees first. We'll give you maybe five or 10 seconds to unmute, to maybe get your thoughts together. Uh, if you have any specific questions for us about the process, about things to consider, about our feedback, about anything we might have went through, uh, we'll defer to the audience first. But if I don't hear any, uh, I'll just go to one of these questions that was emailed to me. Boy, see, ladies, we are just that good. Who could ask any questions after we covered this through as thoroughly as we did, Newberger says with all modesty. So, Mary, maybe you'll be a good person to uh, direct this question to, because I do believe you covered a little of this in uh, one of the slides that you had went through. This is kind of an interesting question. I I've got a thought on this, too, Maureen. I'm sure you do as well. Mary, let's start with you. So, so this question was uh, from an individual that said, let's say that roughly 90% of our workforce wanted to come back. We're excited, it's about darn time, Let, let's get back to normalcy a little bit. But that other 10% did not. As a leader, Mary, what would you do in a situation like that? And they go on to elaborate a bit. Would you modify the entire plan or would you cater to those remaining 10%? Well, I would definitely not modify the entire plan, uh, but I would work with that 10%. I think, as I said, these are challenging times. The important thing would be why, what is their point of concern? And if it's simply, I wanna wait until everything is the way it was pre-COVID, again, I think we're gonna have a new normal. So that may never happen. So I think it's really working with individuals to find out what their issues are and to be empathetic and sensitive to their anxieties because it could be very different from yours and for very valid reasons. Personally, um, I miss the creativity, brainstorming and camaraderie that happens uh, in the office setting. I think we've done an outstanding job of getting everybody set up to work remote, but I think there are areas uh, that we cannot quite get to 100% on. Uh, so even though I want to be flexible and work with everyone, um, our goal is, is to, to have people back in the office at least for part of the time. Makes a lot of sense to me. Maureen, I don't know if you would add anything. I, I've got a thought, but I'll defer to you first. We would, and, I, and I can reread the question again, but any anything else to contribute to that question? Actually, no, I don't have anything else to add. Paul? Yeah, um, yes. Peter sent a question, and his question is, any recommendation on allowing contractors to start coming back into the building? We implemented a remote COVID-19 questionnaire and sign-in. Any other recommendations? That's a good one. Mary, do you want to start with that one? Well, I mean, I know uh, Maureen had, had kind of touched on that. Our position is that there are no outside vendors, contractors, period, until, until the end of phase two, which is basically the end of June. That's the position that we took based upon the concerns of our group and also based upon the fact that we can pretty much continue our business having these meetings uh, virtually on Zoom or whatever the case may be. So we are able to move forward um, limiting that outside contact. And that is the position that we've taken. Um, so again, that's going to vary uh, with every business. Yeah, one thing I want to add, and then Cheryl, yes, I forgot that somebody might be able to use the chat feature, so I'll uh, defer to you uh, before we read another one of these questions that might have come in. But, but yeah, to Mary's point about this, this fear, and again, this fear is a real thing. Per perception is reality to some degree, and you can have 90% of your organization saying, ah, this is overblown, we're done, but for that 10%, it feels like there's going to be another outbreak. They're just terrified to leave their house. You have to take that into consideration. That is real for them. Take it from me. I'm a hard-charging alpha male, but I suffered from crippling anxiety for almost 15 years uh, from college and shortly after college. If you would have told me, Paul, this is all in your head, 
if you would have told me, Paul, this anxiety is not real, well, it feels real to me, and that's not helping anything. So what, I, what I've found as a leader of the STAR group is y- y- you have to be flexible, for sure. You, even if you think their fear is unfounded or unrealistic, you got to listen to it. You got to let it land. You got to let them know that you care. And to Mary's point, you need to take that into consideration. So if we come back June 15th, let's say, and you've got three people that just aren't ready to come back, have a conversation with them. Really try to get to know and understand what's going on. And even if you think there might be an ulterior motive, now this person just wants to work from home. This person's not scared. They're just using that as an excuse. I'm not saying that that's going to be the case. But even if you think that might be, give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, fine, fine. Uh, how about your day is you come back two weeks from now, we'll get you back here June 29th. Fine. So there's got to be some wiggle room. There's got to be some leeway. There's got to be some accommodation, but at some point the line is going to have to be drawn. You, you, I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. They can't say that four or five months down the road. I understand it. I get it. We've taken the precautions to deal with this. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to slowly start to do what we have to do to get you ready. It, it, it's a, it can be a delicate balancing act, but your employees are going to appreciate the care the TLC and understanding what's going on. And we found that is definitely the case with those intimate conversations we've had with our folks. So with that, Cheryl, were there any other questions that were submitted by a text? Otherwise I can go off of uh, another one that I got by email. Not at the moment. Go ahead. Okay. So let's see, maybe Maureen, we'll pick on you with this one. Uh, so, and I've got a thought on this too, especially as it pertains to sales, but you had talked earlier on these slides about um, safe visitor protocol. And obviously some organizations are, are, are putting some protocol into place. Do, do you think there's a line to be drawn between putting so much protocols into place that it actually deters people from visiting your building when that's not what you wanna have happen? What are your thoughts on that? Sure, thank you. So I think with all of this and phasing back into the office, and it goes back to the survey that we had with our employees. If we allow, the goal is to start phasing your employees back into the office and then allow outside visitors at a later date. If we forget all rules and allow safe visitors to start coming now, that could bring more anxiety to our employees and we could lose credibility very quickly. So we have learned that in the last three months, we have been able to do everything via Zoom meetings, telephone, we've made it work. So we want to stick to the guidelines we put in place and continue to wait it out before people start coming into the building. Yeah, and that's that's a tough balancing act for sure. And I know everybody on this call, your your organizations are different, your roles are different, what you do throughout the day is different. We're a, obviously an insurance agency. Sales is a huge part of what we do, and we often have individuals come to our office for personal lines meetings. We'll have vendors come in, carriers come in, referral partners come in. Sometimes even these business owners of the organizations we do group benefits and commercial lines P and C for, and partly too that that's something i got to take into consideration it's not just them coming into the building the other thing we have to be mindful of is what about our producers going out i mean you can't and that was a mary maybe you can touch on this because this was part of our conversation as well Uh, mary actually changed my mind on this because i had thought well you know what rather than letting people into the building because that might expose some of our employees to individuals coming in let's just send our producers out into the field They'll be out into the field. They'll be meeting with these individuals, organizations coming back. That might be a better way of doing this. But Mary actually brought up a good point about controlled environments and maybe why I had that backwards. Mary, do you want to speak to that real quick? Um, sure. Um, I'm trying to remember the conversation, but I, it is. I, I think you're you're referencing right. So. Um, we wanted to make sure that if we were not allowing people to come into this environment that we stood by that and then if they were um you know as as a salesperson they've got to 
continue doing what they do and meeting with people. And again, you need to have comfort in that they are, are going to an environment that is safe. And I guess that will vary with the individual. I know there are still a lot of places that are not allowing the option of coming in to meet. So maybe that limits it to, to a virtual meeting period. But it is, again, um, a comfort level for your staff and, and what is a, a controlled environment uh, that they would feel comfortable within. Is it going, some are fine going to meet with a vendor. Um, some wanna maybe meet at an outside setting, outside patio um, over coffee and they're comfortable with that. And I think it, it just varies with the individual and it varies uh, with the setting. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And, and where Mary started changing my mind on things, again, I just assume, well, let's keep, let's keep people out of the building because this is where our employees are. We don't want people to bring germs in here. If, if people need to meet, let's send our people out. But then Mary had brought up the point about that controlled environment, which she referenced. At least inside our building, we can control the environment. They come in through this door, they go down this hallway, they stay on the first floor, and they go into this conference room. So her point was, it might actually be safer to allow them in in a slow, controlled manner because we dictate where they go, who they see. If we send our three producers to Starbucks, I got no control at Starbucks. I mean, I don't know who they're going to bump into. It's a wide open environment. I don't know how many individuals are going to be there. I don't know who they're going to talk to or who's going to breathe on them along the way. We might actually be putting the star group at more risk by sending our people out than allowing people to come in. So that's a decision you're going to have to make as well. We hear a lot about stay out, stay out, stay out, stay out. If we're going to meet, we're going to go out in the real world. But going out in the real world is something you really can't control, and that might expose your employee or employees to more potential harm than not. So that was something that we discussed, we take that into consideration, and I would just submit that for your uh, consideration as well. I see we have a, a few minutes left. Cheryl, any other uh, questions come to you? Um, no. <laughs> okay, and that's fine, not a problem at all. Why don't we do this? Why don't we end on this? Let's, let's end on a bit of a lightning round, if I may be so bold. Uh, Maureen, I'd love to start with you on this one. What was your biggest takeaway? from this entire experience, either personally or professionally. When we look back on this chapter of society, when we look back on the chapter of our agency in particular, what was your biggest takeaway as a manager from the past couple months? Yeah, you know, you know, we're not in manufacturing, we're a little bit different in the industry we're in, but to look back and to even believe we were home for three months working, who would have thought? And the way the biggest takeaway is how our engagement in our in our culture and how we all came together and meetings and um, I mean I had met I had done lots of Zoom meetings with employees every week we did coffee socials in the morning just to keep that engagement um, there and then to really listen to the employees and look for those little hidden um, agenda items, meaning are they are they nervous? How are they feeling? But my takeaway would have to be, you know, we just, we came together, we made it work. Everyone, you know, there's so much trust and being able to perform and be productive and functional. Um, we, we made it happen, all of us together as a team, the employees included. And um, that was really cool to see how, how, how this all went, worked. Oh, well said, I appreciate that. Mary, I've got a thought, but let's, uh, let's hear from you first. What was your biggest takeaway from this entire well, situation? Uh, uh, sure, quickly. I mean, when this all went down, I was actually out of the country with my family. So, you know, we were lucky to make it back, but stepped into a changed world overnight. And I was, inundated with information overload and trying to wrap my head around what had happened while we were out of the country just eight days and and trying to understand and I think my biggest takeaway is just how resilient we are um if I had thought oh my gosh you know our entire team would 
be working remotely and be, be effective and efficient, that's what we're doing. It's incredible how we have punted and adjusted uh, through this whole process with, without almost missing a beat. So I would say resilience as, as together, we are writing history. This is stuff we're going to, you know, our grandkids are going to read about in history books. So that's my biggest takeaway. Well said. I appreciate that. In terms of me, I'll make it quick, but I have two, and I've kind of alluded to this throughout this webinar here this morning. The first one is you have to meet people where they're at. You really do. I mean, based on the fear, based on how they perceive the world, based on some of the thoughts running through their head. I mean, again, you can't just keep moving the goalpost every week, every month, and uh, you know, you can't avoid confrontation necessarily. But meeting people where they're at, some of our employees just couldn't wait to get back. Others were going into phase two here pretty soon. Others still don't want to come back. So meeting people where they're at, listening to them and understanding why they feel the way that they do. That, that was a big thing for me. I've always felt that way, but never when the stakes were this high. So that meant a lot to me. And then also as the, the president, I oversee the sales team and really am essentially in charge of revenue. I keep talking about productivity, be more productive. Let's be more productive, work harder, not or work smarter, not harder, be more efficient, that kind of thing. And some of our employees are more productive at home. And my preconceived notion that you got to be in the office every day, you got to be here physically every day to talk through things, to meet with your coworkers, et cetera, for some people is not necessarily the case. They're actually more productive at home. And that's one of the things that goes into my decision making process. If I really want to generate revenue for this agency, if I really want to increase productivity, if I really want to make sure that our agency is financially, financially solvent for the longest period of time, to carry on our mission and touch lives, I have to be willing to put people in a, in a position to be as productive as possible. That doesn't mean they can work from home all day, every day, but maybe we can be a little bit more open to thoughts in that regard, and maybe certain people have earned that right because they're more productive. So just a couple of takeaways on my side. So let's wrap up here. Cheryl, if you don't mind, please go into the closing slide. Uh, just wanted to let everybody know that we've got some goodies here for you. In addition to following up, uh, we are going to send you the recording. We are going to send you the PowerPoint just so you can have this information and use it however you best see fit. We also have four white paper resources that we want to share with you as well. You heard us mention these things, but we actually want to give you what we came up with during this reopening process. So you heard us talk about the survey. We're going to send you the survey. You don't have to use the exact same questions, but we're all stronger together. Why reinvent the wheel if you don't have to? I'm biased. I thought we had really good questions. Uh, if you want to emulate them, please feel free to do so. So we'll send you that survey so you can consider using that. Uh, we will send you some sample communications that have come from the one, the only, the Mary Star, in terms of how we communicated, what we communicated. Feel free to use them as email templates. Again, if that makes your job more efficient and effective. We also have a return to work agreement uh, that basically outlines when people are going to come into the office, when do they want to work from home? Again, meet people where they're at. Rather than coming back five days a week, you'll come back two days a week. Uh, here's what our expectations are. Here's what that's going to look like. We'll send that to you so you have that. And then we'll also send you a phased in plan outline, again, that brings some structure and clarity to what we were just talking about from a detail perspective. Lastly, if you would like some assistance, I, I guess I just assumed a lot of other organizations were having the exact same conversations we were. I had assumed that a lot of the same organizations were doing exactly what we were doing, and that's why we had this webinar. We found out that not a lot were, and when they heard what we were doing, they said, wow, can you send me stuff? Wow, that sounds great. Not to say that we're better than anybody, but we were just having conversations people weren't. So if you would like us to help you develop and implement a risk managed back to work plan, somebody from the STAR group will be reaching out. If you're fine, just tell us, no problem, great. We'll have a pleasant conversation, let you go about your day. But if you would find value in having somebody on our team at least offer some assistance, some thoughts, some feedback, Again, we're all in this thing together, and it would be a blessing to help you in that regard. So on behalf of all of us here at the STAR Group, thank you so much for being generous with your time here this morning. Again, I'm Paul Neuberger. On behalf of Maureen Arndt and Mary Starr, we really appreciate everything. Have a fantastic day, and know that we're never too busy for you should you need anything. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.